Welcome to The Supernatural with Laura Maxwell on Eternal Radio. In these programs, we will hear the true supernatural accounts from those who try various spiritualities. You shall tell the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is part two of Natalia's story. And I'll just quickly recap if you haven't heard part one. Natalia was raised primarily in um, a very ritualistic Catholic type of background. She got into New Age and, and, and the occult later on. She believed the universe was our source. Um, she believed in awakening her higher self, the law of attraction, Akashic records, yoga, karma, Hindu gurus, meditation, developing psychic and healing powers. She had a pantheistic view. She attended metaphysical workshops and began to see people getting healed as she developed her abilities. Now, we'll go straight over to Natalia now, and she's speaking from Vancouver in Canada. Hello, Natalia. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. I'm very happy and excited to to continue the story. <laughs> well, so so happy um, to have you. And as I've just said on my blog, I highly commend this show because you know you have such insight into into these things, and you have a great clarity. I feel on sharing about these topics. So really grateful for you coming back for part two. Thank you. And you. You, you mentioned in the last show a couple of books that you read when you were into things of the esoteric nature, and they included Hands of Light by Barbara Brennan and another one by Louise Hay. Did you have any more that you wanted to mention to people just so that they can perhaps avoid these types of books? Yeah, so... Um the author Louise Hay, she's quite well known, at least here in North America, in uh, in in alternative, like more holistic spirituality or, or New Age spirituality. Uh, she's got lots and lots and lots of different books, but she is a well known author um, who her main core message is self healing, um, and she does you know kind of uh, relate to you know chakras and that kind of thing and and traumas in the chakras so um louise hay is definitely like uh an author that i would um that i would avoid i know that she is probably a woman who truly has uh great intentions and good intentions in her heart to see humanity heal from not only physical ailments um but also from emotional trauma um but from my own experience um reading her series of books um, always led me to believe that I myself was responsible for my own not only salvation and healing and that everything that I had experienced as far as trauma or illnesses or any type of pain that I had brought it upon myself mm -hmm. or that um, somebody else who uh, you know caused me pain um, you know that that it was all on me, that it was basically all on my shoulders and that I had to carry all of that and I had to cleanse all of that and heal all, all of that on my own. So it was, it's definitely a very slippery slope um, and quite the rabbit hole to get into. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, guilt that can come from that. And just it's just it's a very heavy burden to carry when you're taught that everything's on you. Mm -hmm. um, so Louise Hay, there's also, you know, very powerful. Uh, popular teacher, uh, the Eckhart Tolle, uh, the power of now. Um, he was, uh, in, especially here in North America, he's very popular. Um, the power of now. And also, uh, I think it's, um, I think it's some, I can't remember the exact name of the book, uh, I read it years ago, but it was all about the new world, uh, that we're supposed to be stepping into a new paradigm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also another book uh, by, um, it's called, it's supposed to be a channeled book by an entity called Cryon. 
and it's another another series of books this entity cry on channel through a specific author but the one book that i had was called the 12 layers of dna and uh, so it's basically just explaining how you can unlock all the 12 layers of dna on your own for self-healing once again uh dr wayne dyer another another popular author here and uh, marianne williamson as well um uh is a very very popular um teacher and author here in North America and um, her teachings and her books were something that I definitely got very attached to as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well thank you for sharing that and perhaps at the end of the show you can share some books that, that have helped you or that you're currently reading and um, that are quite a contrast to those ones in case mm -hmm. listeners are interested. Now you mentioned to me um, before the show Natalia that when you were five years old, in actual fact, something happened that you forgot to mention at the start of show one. So pl please share um, when you were five. Yeah, so um, I didn't mention this last time, but in recapping uh, kind of all the details of my part one, I realized that I didn't mention that a very strong and vivid memory I have, and it's actually quite important uh, because it's also an indication that children are also very vulnerable and very privy to this type of um, deception and to this type of uh, these types of practices and there doesn't necessarily have to be a specific mentor or a teacher teaching them these things I think the spirit world uh, it has access to children just as much as adults if not more mm -hmm. um, so when I was about five six years old um, while there was still a lot of, you know, uh, I guess, turmoil going on in my home within my family, I would always seek refuge, like I said before, in my in my room, and I would have personal conversations with Jesus. Um, but there was particular times, I think at least uh, five or six times, where I would go to my room, and I remember in my room, um, on the closet doors, there was these very long mirrors, basically mirrors to just kind of dress yourself and, to, you know, to see what you look like before you head out the door. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, just sitting there one day, I just sat in front of the mirror. And I think it was because there was something going on in my family that I just sat in front of the mirror and I was feeling kind of really just upset and a bit sad. And uh, I just began to, I just began to stare at myself, you know, without any particular intention. Um, but I, there was a point where I was staring at myself and I just began to kind of get in a bit of a trance like state. So I wasn't just staring at myself because I thought it was fun. Like I, I got drawn in to my own reflection. Mm -hmm. So I started to just, uh, I actually drew myself closer to the mirror. So I kind of, uh, uh, sat a little bit closer to the mirror so that my face would literally be right in front of the mirror so that all I could see was my eyes looking right back at me and I don't know what particularly drew me to do that but it was about a span of about five minutes where I was just looking at myself and then it came into okay sit right in front of the mirror and gaze at your own reflection like deeply and so I started to look right into my own eyes looking right back at me and after about, you know, five to seven minutes of doing that, I definitely was in some kind of a strange uh, trance-like state. Mm -hmm. um, where everything just went silent and my mind went blank completely. And out of nowhere, I started to question in my own mind, um, who am I? And I said it once and then I said it again and I said it again and it became kind of like this mantra. And so I would stare at myself in my own eye, at my own eyes, and I kept repeating to myself, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Mm -hmm. And I kept doing this for several minutes, and, and it was definitely like a very deep, altered, like meditation slash trance, like state that I was in. It's very, and, it's very profound for a five-year-old yeah. child, yeah. Yeah, and I remember that I did that um, quite a, you know, I think... After about 10 minutes of being in this state, I was basically left in a, a completely 
altered state of, um, and I didn't feel afraid. Mind you, it was a very different feeling I had versus when I would speak to Jesus. And I make that very clear mm-hmm. that I, I, I did feel calm, but I didn't necessarily feel love. Like I didn't feel like a lot of love kind of come over me. Like when I would be Jesus Christ, I always felt like my heart would become warm. And I just felt like a lot of, a lot of love. But in, in this particular state, um, it was, it was very contrasting. You know, I didn't feel afraid, but it was a, a very altered state. And after about 10 minutes of being in this uh, meditation and, and repeating this mantra over to myself, I would be left in a very blank, completely you know, kind of so-called Zen state where I had no thoughts in my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't centered on any particular anything. I was just completely blank and I would just stare at myself. So I would complete my who am I and I would stay silent for a few seconds and continue to stare at myself. And so I was kind of, I felt like in this altered state where I was basically left with my mind and my soul completely uh, just at nothing, centered on nothing, just blank, but also very much like vulnerable because I was so not focused on anyone or anything particularly that I felt like basically what I had done is opened my mind and opened my soul. And I don't know what or whom, you know, was influencing that particular um, practice, But I would stay like that for anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes. And after I was done, I would kind of just snap out of it, Mm -hmm. you know, and go back to my normal activities. Um, But there was something very eerie about that is that I was drawn to that self-divination. I liked looking at myself in that way. And I don't think there's anything wrong with looking at yourself in the mirror and accepting yourself for who you are. Mm -hmm. But there was almost this like vanity about it as well, Mm -hmm. where I really really loved to kind of uh, look at myself in this very kind of vain way at six years old, you know, five, Mm -hmm. six years old. And I did that about, I would say about six or seven times. And I didn't do it very regularly. Um, I did it over the span of about two years. Mm -hmm. And I would always do it um, when I felt like I would have some privacy. I did have a younger brother, but you know, if he was you know, playing with his friends or kind of in another room in the home, I would go and I would close the door and I would do this. And every single time that I did it, the practice would become stronger and I would do it for longer. Mm -hmm. And the emotion at the end of feeling completely blank uh, lasted longer. So it was kind of being in the gap between thoughts. You know, I had no thoughts. Mm -hmm. And being an adult now reflecting on onto kind of the meditations that I was doing as an adult, that was kind of the main objective is being in a gap between thoughts Mm -hmm. and being in a state of nothing and and complete silence, inner silence, so to say, witnessing the inner self or the higher self. Um, I feel like as a child, I don't know why that happened to me, but I did it about six or seven times. And um, to this very day, I remember like um, just how powerful that that feeling was and Mm -hmm. it kind of gave me I think a false sense of peace and and um just empowerment but it didn't feel very I mean it didn't it didn't feel very warm or loving it was Mm -hmm. actually quite cold to be honest with you Mm -hmm. because it isolated me um you know I wasn't praying to anything or to anyone but myself and I would isolate myself for all of that time and and uh, I didn't talk to anyone about it. I didn't feel like it was okay for me to tell my mom or my dad or my brother about it um, because I felt like they wouldn't understand. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, after doing it for a few times, I guess like I just, I, I stopped doing it for no particular reason, but there was definitely a strange time period there where I felt like I was getting really um, mm-hmm. Attached to that practice. And I think maybe, you know, prayers of my mom or my dad without even knowing what I was doing, you know, just them praying probably um, protected and stopped that. But I wouldn't recommend that. I think that is a practice of self divination. And I did Mm -hmm. um, now segueing into like my adult, um, the second part of my testimony. um, That is a practice that I did continue in in my adult life. I was told by the people in my life at the time where I was starting to feel, uh, you know, like tingling in my hands when I was practicing massage on people. So by this time, 
I had, um, you know, particular people in my life who were influencing me, um, who were also into this type of um, spirituality and belief system. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I would get my tarot cards read and I was, you know, obviously speaking a lot about my personal history and my life. And so sharing all of these things with with these particular individuals and and opening up my whole story, um, they would relate to that particular incident and say that I had been gifted as a young child, that I was a special child and that Mm -hmm. I had a gifted um, self divination. So that's kind of a practice of self divination Mm -hmm. and was encouraged Mm -hmm. to uh, practice that uh, in my adult life in order to get um, some answers when I needed answers for some decisions that I needed to make when I needed clarity, uh, when I needed to feel a sense of peace and empowerment um, in myself and, and in my higher self, because what I was told is that that activated my higher self. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, if I was ever feeling down about myself or a low self esteem, that practicing that self divination would awaken the higher self to higher levels and, um, would, would diminish my ego. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, when I practiced it in my adult life, it was very, very, it was so much more intense. Mm -hmm. And, um, what it had ended up happening towards the end of doing this mantra and meditation with looking at myself in the mirror, I would get into a blank state of mind. But what happened afterwards is that I would begin to channel. Mm -hmm. Um, So um, my voice would get slightly altered and I would continue to stare at myself in the mirror. But then um, obviously some type of spirit would enter me because of that. Something that I want to make clear because you're left so open and blank. Mm -hmm. You open your soul up to um, entities. Mm -hmm. And I basically had done that in my adult life because I had, I had already been meditating and doing all this other kind of stuff. So I basically opened up a portal (laughs) Mm -hmm. and allowed for this to enter me. And so I would get channeled messages about who I was about, um, messages about my past lives of being a healer. Um, and that, you know, my, my purpose in this life was to be a healer again and to reactivate that so that I could heal people and to help bring beauty into this world. Mm -hmm. Um, I would do that when I would, um, you know, have privacy, but I I would also do it when there was other people in the home as well. So, uh, I would definitely feel kind of very special after because I was like, wow, you know, I channeled a specific spirit and Mm -hmm. all the messages that were being channeled that I was seeing, for example, were all very like, uh, in, in a sense, uh, loving messages of being a great person and, and having a great purpose on in this life. Um, there was nothing ever negative said about me when I was channeling. And Mm -hmm. so it does kind of boost up your ego in a sense. And it makes you feel quite special that a spirit would come through you and to channel this amazing message. Absolutely. You've been chosen, um, for it. You you would feel, and I I think it's interesting when that happened to you, age five, no one taught you, uh, divination, No. no one taught you meditative states or opening yourself to entities But it happened, and I think, you know, it's a a reminder of the fact that we do all inherit things, often from our mother's side or our father's side. And sometimes if there has been such practices back in the generations, we we do inherit it. And therefore, you know, the enemy will try at an early age to get us down that path pretty quickly. Um, Mm -hmm. And it, it... can be a similar theme that I do hear from people's testimonies that they'll say yeah they were into new age as an adult or into the occult as an adult but they remember they had a profound experience as a child when like you said Natalia that the doors um were were definitely Mm -hmm. opened opened then yeah and it's it's always like I, I feel very very common as well that those things will happen when um, there's some type of wounding or some type of pain or some type of fear happening as well because I think that also opens up our soul Mm -hmm. in certain respects because we're seeking we're seeking you know love we're seeking healing and even when we're not aware of it those types of things are basically you know an open window Mm -hmm. Um, and when we don't have the discernment 
you know, we're basically inviting a plethora of, of entities that come in the name of love and light and really don't have anything Mm -hmm. but ill will towards you. Um, so in continuing uh, my story, the, I guess like where I was at this point now was that I was doing these things like mirror activations. Um, I had actually been introduced and I think I, I talked about this a bit in the, uh, my previous, um, story, my previous, uh, testimony was that, uh, I had hung around and was hanging around particular people who were very much deeply involved in, um, channeling and tarot card reading and you know we're we're very much involved in this type of spirituality and so I kind of feel that I had fallen under um you know like in a sense like apprenticeship and I was being mentored and I was going to metaphysical workshops um and one of the things that I do want to uh kind of recap a little bit was when I was doing these metaphysical workshops Mm -hmm. uh, where I was being used as kind of a, a scapegoat for everybody's collective pain body and collective trauma to be released through me um what would happen this one particular what happened this one particular time after the third session so basically it was kind of like a series of uh, a particular method of metaphysical healing where it was called one mind um healing and uh the third time that i did it and i did mention last time that i kind of got into this really weird you know uh altered state and my body was contorting and she was using a particular um the person the teacher teaching this workshop was using a particular device on me mm-hmm. which looked like a wand and so when i was being i was the chosen one to be used as the person who would release the group's collective pain Um, After that particular session, which was very intense, I remember um, when she was using the wand on me and going back into not my my past life, but but into this current life, but in in the past. So Mm -hmm. from my womb, my my conception to being in the womb, to being born and my childhood and all of that, she was basically saying that she was releasing all of that collective trauma and she would take her time in each stage so that I would have the time to do that, but also bringing in everybody else's stuff too. After that particular night, um, you know, I did have a, a, a very uh, demonic encounter and I wasn't aware of it mm-hmm. um, because during the session, I was crying deeply, 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 like, uh, and, and, and got into very contorted positions so much so that I was like not really in control of my body and the group had to hold up. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, um, I began to laugh almost in a cackling way, which was very creepy. But I felt uh, in my body that I had um, released a lot of trauma. Like, that's what I was told. And so that's what I felt. I was like, wow, I was crying like a baby before. And now I'm feeling all this laughter. So the group was very happy and very relieved and grateful to me that I was, you know, being used as the the channel for the collective release of all this uh, trauma. I went home that night feeling, wow, like, you know, this is amazing. I can't believe like what's, what's going on in my life. And I'm being used for such astounding healing in my community. Mm -hmm. But I remember walking home, uh, from that workshop and it was broad daylight, but I remember this very strange feeling of something following me. And I was walking uh, through the school grounds and I remember like, this bush that I was looking at when I was walking and I felt like there was something there just watching me. It was so odd and so very creepy, so scary. I was like, it just gave me goosebumps. Mm -hmm. So I continued to like just hurry home. I didn't think too much of it because after you're in these very intense metaphysical workshops, you, you are kind of left in an altered state where your discernment definitely isn't really, isn't really there. So you Mm -hmm. don't really have the ability to kind of, uh, discern like what what's evil what's really dark you're kind of left in this kind of quote-unquote blissed out state so even though I did feel this weird thing following me I didn't really correlate it to anything evil so I got home uh you know did my usual routine went and and as I was going to sleep all the lights are turned off the city lights are still kind of um the street lights are still kind of uh bright enough that they're uh, coming into my home mm-hmm. so you can basically still see stuff in my home you can see in my kitchen and I noticed that uh, there was something in my kitchen a very 
and I did feel something in my spirit and my soul at this point, like there was a lot of fear that I was feeling and there was something in my kitchen watching me. Um, I didn't necessarily see a physical body or a physical uh, like thing or, or shape, but I did kind of see like a dark silhouette Mm -hmm. and I was so afraid and in my knowledge and in at the time and I guess in my in my you know ignorance I just you know prayed in the name of love and light and I said you know in the name of love and light if this is a manifestation of my ego you know um, I give no room for that so I was basically correlating that to ego showing up in a physical form in order for me to stop practicing the metaphysical things that I was doing in order to diminish my ego Mm -hmm. So I went back to the mentor who was teaching that class and let her know about that. And she said that that was very common and um, that those are the types of things that happen when you do these types of workshops and these practices, because what you're doing is you're elevating and ascending to the higher levels of consciousness. And all your ego wants to do is to keep you into the lower levels, into the lower, um, into, yeah, into lower levels of consciousness. And so it'll do anything and manifest itself in, in very odd, peculiar ways in order to scare you out of ascending higher. And that, so, you know, w- when I was involved in such things, um, although they were slightly different from what you're describing, um, different but similar, you know, we were, we were also taught, we were given explanations like that as well when such things happened to us. Um, and mm-hmm. it's amazing how the, the rationale given could seem um, quite sensible and, and logical until, of course, you, more and more things happen and you begin to question it all. Yes. Um, I mean, I was very shaken by it in a bit because I had already been kind of, in a way, programmed into believing that it wasn't necessarily an evil entity from hell it was basically a manifestation within me that my mind had created in order to stop me from ascending into the higher levels and so Mm -hmm. from you know the higher you ascend you basically start these manifestations start to happen and it's just a a sign that you are raising your vibrations Mm -hmm. as you raise your vibrations you know the lower uh energies will want to keep you in that lower field so Mm -hmm. you just have to push through basically um I had also uh been introduced uh you know to the person who was reading my tarot cards on a regular basis had introduced me to um a particular uh two other people um she was reading my tarot cards in one particular um night when my birthday was coming around the corner and she said that she wanted to give me a free reading uh, in order to kind of usher in the new year for me as my birthday was coming in and it was going to be a full moon. Um, So because I had already, you know, was believing in astrology and all of that too, I felt like it was perfect timing for her to read my cards on a full moon and on the cusp of my birthday. Um, So I went over to her place and she read my tarot cards for me and, um, towards the end of the reading because I was every time I would get a reading I would get more drawn in because the answers was you know the answers to the questions I had were always so clear and very vivid and Mm -hmm. very personalized for me um she said that she uh was being told by her spirit guides that um you know she asked her spirit guides because she was in contact with these two other particular individuals before uh before reading these cards to me like she she basically had a clientele and these two particular individuals were regulars of hers and she felt that um it would be a good uh meeting it would be good for me to meet these individuals and for for us to form a friendship Mm -hmm. so she said towards the end of the reading i think um i'm going to ask my spirit guides if it's in your best interest to meet these two people and so she asked spirit guides and she said that her spirit guides were roaring yes, saying that yes, she needs to meet them. And so she set up another meeting for all of us to come together, which was the following Friday. And um, when we came together from that very first night of meeting these two people, um, they were a couple, um, that was a very large gateway and doorway going deeper into um, 
the spirituality that I was practicing. Mm -hmm. And this couple had been going to see this tarot card reader regularly um, and were doing their own self-healing journey. And uh, basically, by the time that I sat down and, and started to introduce myself and to speak them, I started to notice that the the male um uh the person you because it was a a male and female couple Mm -hmm. the guy was already um I felt like he was uh showing signs of being kind of like flustered and was kind of a little bit not necessarily like upset but I felt like he was a bit like um anxious and so I asked him like is it everything was okay and he's like no you know I'm totally fine but this starts to happen to me sometimes I get sweaty and sometimes I um, I feel, you know, um, you know, changes in my body temperature when, um, my spirit guides need to channel information to me. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I had let them know that I was completely open to receiving any messages that they had for me. And he said, good, because they have a lot of things that they need to say to you. And so basically from that very night on, um, we had formed a very close friendship and even to this day, like I want to make clear that I do have these, some of these individuals still in my life. Definitely. I I don't practice these things anymore, but Mm -hmm. um, all of these people, again, they have very good intentions and they're kind people. And I could sit down and I, and I could talk to them to this day because they're not, um, you know, people that I'm afraid of or that are doing um, inherently evil things to people. But I um I want to make clear that the reason why I formed a friendship with them is because we were all really just seeking healing and and mm-hmm. and to feel love. But yeah. that very night, he basically um, said to me that I was clearly chosen by um, particular ascended masters to be a very powerful healer. That again, it was reconfirming that I was one in a past life, and that I was going to eventually. Um, begin a uh, healing practice so an energy healing practice and I felt like well I don't know how to how to do that because I've never been certified as a Reiki practitioner mm-hmm. I have been certified into any particular modality of, of energy healing and he said that I didn't need to be certified in this world uh, by any worldly or earthly certification program because I I'm already gifted and so I just could basically go ahead and just call it intuitive energy healing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the session lasted for quite a few hours, you know, we were there until the very early morning hours of Saturday morning, just talking about, you know, what messages he had for me and that, um, I was going to make a huge impact in the world and that I would eventually write a book about, you know, my, my healing and what I, um, wanted to, to offer to the world. And so I basically right away, like formed a really deep friendship and connection with these people. And what happened is every Friday, following that particular meeting, um, we we had spiritual gatherings. Mm -hmm. And um, we would, all four of us would read tarot cards, we would do meditation. And I had let them know that, again, that I had started to feel some type of activation and healing in my hands. And that um, after doing those metaphysical workshops that I would, you know, have the ability to touch a person and they would feel tingling in their hands and they would feel energy through. And so they said basically at a breakthrough point where I would be able to fully activate it into doing energy healing for people. And um, it progressively got deeper and deeper where like I just felt so uh, necessarily um, like I had all the answers, but I felt like during this time where I was doing these practices with them on Friday nights. There was also other things in my um, my everyday life that were falling into place, so to say. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I would get the right opportunities. You know, I would meet um, particular people. I would have a lot of synchronicities. Mm-hmm. A lot of synchronicities were happening in my life. And so everything in my, you know, so quote unquote, everyday not spiritual life when I would be at work and doing my everyday thing, plus my spiritual lifetime, all of that kind of was lining up. And so it very much pigeonholed my mentality into believing that there could not be anything wrong about this because Mm -hmm. everything Mm -hmm. is falling into place. There are so many synchronicities. Um, Everything is pointing in this particular direction. Like I am on the path of enlightenment. And um, when we were gathering, I mean, uh, probably by the fourth time, um, 
we started to do like massaging on each other, like, uh, like Reiki style, you know, like energy healing. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mm -hmm. like if one of us was complaining of some type of like pain in our body or a headache, Mm -hmm. or if we're, um, feeling like we needed to purge some type of trauma, we started to practice that type of intuitive energy healing on each other. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I was very much, feeling like, okay, this is amazing. I'm getting more and more activated. And so basically I felt like I had been fully activated. I was channeling as well. So when I would lay my hands on either of the individuals in our group of four, I would always feel, um, that there was something that would enter me because we would do a meditation and I would say in the name of love and light, I just um, open up myself to, to love and light and for my spirit guides and the spirit guides of this individual to share through me what healing this person needs right now. So I never directed the prayer to any particular spirit guide or to any specific ascended master. Um, I mean, sometimes we would, uh, we would, um, you know, call on, you know, Krishna or on, uh, you know, any, like, no, just particular spirit guides in general that we felt we had personally for us, but we didn't feel like we had to. It was just sometimes because we did a tarot card reading or a meditation, we felt like the presence of a particular ascended master or spirit guides in the home. So we would kind of allow for that spirit guide or that ascended master to kind of take control of the session. Mm-hmm. And, um, I would, uh, close my eyes, I would put my hand over a person, because usually when you're doing energy healing, you're not necessarily touching the person all the time. Um, Or I would touch the person if I felt guided to, but right away, my hands would completely just go Mm -hmm. and do their own thing. I had no control. Can I ask you, Natalia, sorry for interrupting, did you also do do it in the sense of perhaps over the telephone or or like distant healing, we, we may call it that, or was it usually just face-to-face with a client um when when we were meeting on Fridays it was always just Mm face-to-face um but when I was doing metaphysical workshops the conductor or so-called the mentor I guess would do um she would she would do distance ones over the phone with me actually yeah yeah. so I was I was doing that as well yeah um so because space and time there's no limits or boundaries or anything, we were told that it didn't matter where we were, that we could send this loving energy over the phone, Mm -hmm. over the internet, like it didn't, over meditation, it didn't matter, kind of through, through our third eye, um, through, yeah, so Mm -hmm. yes, I definitely did practice over the phone stuff, (laughs) um, but when we were doing these, uh, healing sessions, um, my, my, what I felt and what I relate a lot to the group was that I felt like I had eyes on the tips of my fingers. Um, because I could, even though my eyes were closed and I, I had no like conscientious, uh, control or knowing where I would massage the person or how I would manipulate, you mm-hmm. know, like if I was massaging their hands, I felt like I could see inside of their tissue. I could see inside of like their, their, their organs and look inside like their body and kind of feel and see like where it is that they needed some type of assistance or healing. Mm -hmm. And it was very odd because I would just do like my hands would just work and and move in ways that I'd never been trained to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And every time that the session was over, the person, um, either one of us three, like, you know, the three that I would practice on would always say that they felt a lot of peace coming over them or that they would feel tingling or some type of sensation. And sometimes there were emotions Mm -hmm. like crying that would be activated after doing these or or during doing the session. Um, You know, if I would massage the scalp, if I would massage the neck, or if I would stay still, sometimes my hands would just be placed on a particular area of the body Mm -hmm. and I would feel a buzzing in my hands. I would feel tingling and uh, you know, I would channel messages to this person about something that they were experiencing in the moment about um, a lack of true self-identity and that it was time for them to release this, um, you know, this layer of their ego. And so sometimes there was a lot of emotion being released through, you know, crying. Um, And so there was a lot of physical signs that this stuff was working. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
there was no reason for me to doubt that I was, you know, a, a true healer and that I was surrounded by other healers. And, um, the male, um, the, the guy of the group was very much in contact with his spirit guides constantly and, and had a very psychic ability to communicate with his guides and relay those messages to me, um, and to, you know, to his partner and also to the, uh, to the other female uh, there who was the tarot card reader. Mm-hmm. Um, And so basically we trusted everything that he was saying to be true because it was all very accurate. A lot of the time it was extraordinarily accurate. And, um, you know, I had explained everything to them about my, my life and and the illness that I had been diagnosed with and, um, how I had left the toxic relationships in order for me to find my true self and to, to do self healing. And they were all very supportive, um, you know, I at this point started to read the book uh, by channeled by Cryon, which is supposed to be, um, I believe, a Palladian uh, entity. So if you're not familiar with that, it's basically um, like a, a an entity from the Palladian um, star, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So they're basically spirit guides. For, they're supposed to be kind of like our... Um, I guess, alien spirit guides. So I started to read read this. It was a book given to me by a person in one of these metaphysical workshops. And I started to read this book, which is the 12 layers of DNA. And um, when I was reading this book, what I was being told was that I had, you know, that everybody has Akashic records, that everything from all of their past lives and their current life is recorded in these records in this other dimension, and that you can access everything from your past lives, all of your skills and your abilities and your gifts, you can access all of those things if you can access your Akashic records through certain unlocking of your name. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of the the meditations we were doing on our Friday night sessions were also about unlocking abilities and gifts um, from our Akashic records. And so we were basically doing also DNA activation, mm-hmm. uh, which is also very popular. I know it's, it's something that um, a lot of people feel is like an incredible tool and an asset if they have like, why not, you know, why not activate these things? But I, again, I didn't know what I was really getting into and, because I had, you know, gone through quite a few Friday night sessions with this, you know, with this group, um, very, very regularly. At the same time I was reading this book, I got to this point in the book where it was talking about self healing of illness. Mm -hmm. And I felt like all of this time I had been, um, you know, healing and doing metaphysical practices and workshops and meditations and mantras and um, you know, uh, using crystals as well to cleanse, to cleanse, um, you know, my chakras. So mm-hmm. I had, you know, spent quite a lot of time doing this and I felt like, okay, it's not a coincidence that I'm reading this chapter in this book right now. And it's fallen on healing self of physical illness. I have this, you know, un uh, incurable disease in my body and I'm, I'm ready to let it go. Mm-hmm. I feel like, um, this illness was taught to me that it was a teacher. Mm-hmm. So instead of me being, you know, someone telling me that this illness I had been diagnosed with as being a curse or something bad for me, that it wasn't from God, I was told that it was a teacher for me and that I had to um, relate to this illness in a positive way and use it as a teacher in order for me to ascend. Kinda so I like, felt kind of like yeah. the, the whole kind of a karmic idea yeah. of, of teaching. We're, we're all running out of time. So I just want to, yeah. to interrupt to, to say something briefly. Um Again, I've heard so many people who used to channel so-called Palladians um, discover the truth about all of that. But what I find interesting is it's not just people who have become Christians who share this view, but also some people who they're no longer light workers or they're no longer channelers, but they've not become a Christian. So they're not saying that um, these Palladians are demons in the way that a Christian will say it but they are saying that hey they discovered these Palladians and these other um, ascended masters etc were te- yeah. telling them lies and actually we yeah. had evil intent were evil spirits and so they left that whole arena which I find is interesting because they haven't become Christians but they're still saying the same thing we are saying um, so we're almost running out of time um, 
could you, sorry, a little noise just happened there. Could you, um, we'll continue for part three, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> de definitely. Could you mention um, any books or any resources that you feel listeners might find useful? Yeah, so I think I did briefly mention some of the books uh, last time. Um, I like to recommend particular authors um, and just to, before I mention this, um, Palladians, there's also the Syrians as well. There, there can be many, many different uh, you know, ascended masters and guides from other constellations that people pray to and, and meditate to. So it's not just the Palladians. So I just want to make clear that that's just one of many of course. Um, spirit guides. Um, but in my third uh, part, I will mention how that uh, all came to truth. Mm -hmm. Um so just a fair warning that it doesn't have to be just Palladians. It could be the Syrians and the Arcturians as well and all the other plethora. Um, so the, some of the authors that I really, really enjoy even to this day, listening to, um, you know, their talks and, and, and reading what they have to share is um, Warren B. Smith. Warren B. Smith is a fantastic author and speaker who speaks so much truth to this context and subject matter because he was in this spirituality for over I believe 25 years he was in it even in the 70s when it all came from the east to North America so mm -hmm. um, he's practiced yoga and meditation and and psychic abilities and and uh, you know energy healing and all of this kind of stuff you know like he's very familiar with it and, and came to light and now he speaks to that and has a ministry um, where he's speaking to the general public about it but also speaks to the churches about um, the um how that can infiltrate the church as well and how Christians can also be deceived, mm -hmm. which is, I think, very important um, to, to know as well. Uh, there's also, Christ um, sorry, um, Johanna Michelson, The Light That Was Dark, I believe, or the, no, sorry, The Beautiful Side That Was Evil, The Beautiful Side of Evil or, or The Dark, I can't remember, The Beautiful Side of, of the Darkness. Basically, the gist of the book is how darkness and evil can disguise itself as being beautiful Mm -hmm. as being loving. Um, I will write down the particular names of the books for my, my next one, but her name is Johanna Michelson. Uh, she's found on, on Facebook and on YouTube. She's also someone who uh, practiced a lot of um, psychic and energy uh, healing and occultism for a long period of time and then came to, to know Jesus as well. Mm -hmm. So all of these, these two particular people... Um, I recommend all the time because for anyone who's still questioning or anybody who's wandering or just kind of not really sure, reading from these particular um, uh, authors <clears throat> and listening to their testimonies brings a lot of light and context to this subject matter, which can be very delicate because it's one thing to listen to a person who's never experienced alternative spirituality and say, well, they don't know what they're talking about because in my meditations, I felt love and I felt peace mm -hmm. and so many good things were happening in my life. They don't understand. But these types of authors and, and these speakers, they know all of those experiences because they led their whole lives like that and went through the gamut mm -hmm. of all um, alternative spirituality and metaphysical practices. And so they're coming from a place of knowing Mm -hmm. what it feels like to have those blissed out experiences, to have the chronicities and to have the false appearances of love and light come into their life yeah. um, and, and, and lead their lives completely so much so that they even made a living out of it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a place um, that you can relate to. It's coming from a place and a, and a perspective that you can relate to. And they speak very clearly about it because they spent such a long time yeah. in it and, they're not in it anymore. So they're coming from a place of love as well, mm -hmm. wanting to warn people. Um, and I think that's the most important thing as well. Inclusion is that, you know, in recommending these particular authors and speakers, um, it's just for you to kind of learn a little bit more about what um, people like myself and Laura and these two other people have experienced and what were the trigger points in order for them to kind of <clears throat> turn away from this type of spirituality Mm -hmm. and warn other people about um, the deception, but coming from a place of love. So if you're not sure, if you're, you know, if you think all this is crazy, if you think we have no idea what we're talking about, I would just encourage you, you know, you know, because whatever it is that you're practicing to just keep an, an open heart and a soft heart and a, and a warm heart and a, and 
a loving perspective all, on all of this and just just ask, you know, you know, what what is this all about and can this have any truth? And Jesus Christ, even if you do believe that he is just an ascended master, just like Buddha or, or Krishna or, or Allah is, if he is still that to you, you can still access Jesus Christ directly if you speak to him directly and just say, Jesus Christ. I have questions about this. I don't know what all of this means, but if you have some type of answer for me, just ask him to guide you, ask him to show you some answers. And I guarantee that Jesus Christ himself, the person who came to the planet for you um, to save you and to love on you will provide you answers because at the end of the day, it's his love and his grace um, that we want to direct you towards. So Mm -hmm. I say all of that in love. <laughs> Absolutely. I echo what you've said. And, and Johanna Michelson's book, The Beautiful Side of Evil, was one yes. which a Christian gave my mother when my mother was a spiritualist medium. My mother hid the book from me because I think she knew um, it would open my eyes and she didn't want me to be deceived by Jesus, as it were. But eventually my mother and I did did come to Jesus. It's a very powerful book. Um, she, mm-hmm. talk, she talks about, um, you know, supernatural healing where the Philippine healers would put their hands right into someone's body and perform surgery yes. with the anesthetic and all that. So these things yes. are so, so true and so powerful. And it's interesting, yes. you know, when you mentioned the Pleiadians and so on and this, you know, DNA activation, Akashic records and what have you, that and it's an interesting thing. I often think that so many New Agers, their belief system, um, although they're, you know, against the Illuminati and so on, what they don't realise is that a lot of it is actually the Illuminati um, and Luciferians and all that stuff too. Yeah. Uh, you know, and yeah. the, 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 the scientists today who have admitted that they want to change our DNA and so on, you know, it's it's all uh, actually all linked. <laughs> and, you know, as, as we'll find out in the next show with you, Jesus Christ can reveal the truth about what's really going on here and natalia your a youtube video is um you have a youtube testimony the last three hours and that's in spanish so next time i want you to tell us more about that so that the listeners can go and listen to that if they speak spanish yeah Um, yeah so we have three minutes left could you please pray for the listeners yes Jesus Christ, I just want to thank you so much for giving me the opportunity and the time and the energy to share my story. I pray that all the listeners listening to this, Lord, just feel the Holy Spirit come into their homes and come into their heart and just warm them with your love, Lord. I just pray in Jesus' name that they encounter you in ways that they've never encountered you, Lord. That their hearts feel your presence tangibly touch them in their lives. And that you would present yourself, Lord, in particular ways for them and meet them where they are in their life right now. And that whoever's listening to this, whatever questions, whatever doubts and whatever fears they have, Lord, that you would answer them, that you would come to them, give them peace, give them the guidance. And I just pray the spirit of discernment over these people, Jesus, that you would touch them um, and, and provide the guidance that they need so that they can come to truthful um, conclusions about your true identity as the true loving God and father that you are to all of us, Lord, and that your love is available to each and every one of us, that you ask nothing of us, but just for us to come to you with an open heart to invite you in so that you can pour your love on us, Lord. You love us so very much. And for anybody out there that's listening, who's feeling Um, rejected who's feeling lonely I speak to anyone out there who's feeling alone and is is uh, practicing alternative spirituality so that they can feel loved I pray in Jesus name that they feel the love of the Holy Spirit just shower them and envelop them and and completely surround them that they know in their hearts that the Lord will will tell them and show them and guide them that they are not alone that they are loved beyond all worldly measure And that what they're seeking is the love of Jesus Christ, which will fill every void and completely dissolve all fears and heal all wounds. And that the love and the light, the true light of Jesus Christ is the way and the home and the security that they are seeking. So I just pray in Jesus name that this testimony speak life over people, that it speak truth 
and that it, it just helps them feel that love that the Lord Jesus Christ has to offer and that, that it comes in love, that it comes in peace, not to judge, nor to scold, nor to condemn, but to just uh, provide guidance and some wisdom for people who really, at the end of the day, are seeking you, Lord. They seek you. So I just pray in Jesus' name that their hearts be touched and that they're open to come directly to you, Jesus Christ, to seek you and to get answers directly from you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. And I really do echo Natalia's prayer with my heart and soul, and I think it's just a powerful prayer. I really, really do hope people prayed along with Natalia there. Now, please tune in again next time for part three of Natalia's powerful testimony. Thank you so much, sister, for sharing and look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Bye for now. Bye. The views expressed in this production may not necessarily be those of Eternal Radio. Eternal Radio. Now Eternal Radio is even easier to listen to. You can do this by simply visiting eternalradio.org.uk That's eternalradio.org.uk and clicking on the Listen Now link. Alternatively, you can listen in on your phone by downloading the TuneIn app or Eternal Radio's very own dedicated apps for both Android and iPhone. It's also possible to tune in on a variety of other platforms including Amazon's Fire TV. Also, if you have any questions for me or for other Eternal Radio hosts, please email us at onairnow at eternalradio.org.uk That's onairnow at eternalradio.org.uk